Fractal design cases have inspired modders all over the world who have built some amazing systems like this dark side themed case by George Priscellus showcasing the spacious internals in the Define S, or Metallic Acid, a mini ITX system by Justin Olson featuring a white, black, and red color scheme and a super clean layout in the Define Nano S. There are a ton more awesome builds like these on Fractal Design's modding series page, so check it out via the sponsor link in this video's description and get inspired for your next project. Excellent! Hello everyone, and welcome to this month's episode of Probing Paul. I have a lightsaber for no no real reason at all, but um, it is October 2017. This is a monthly Q&A video that I do every month, hence it being monthly. And this is episode number 20. If you want to uh, check out the past episodes, there's a playlist for Probing Pauls. And you can go back and look at all the old ones. I've been doing this for almost two years now. I made a joke last time that not everyone got, but... Um, Let's just get right into it, shall we? The first question here is from that guy shared, and I believe this is from Reicher. What's up, Reicher? Uh, hey, Paul, who is your favorite tech YouTuber? Very good question. Uh, I should have thought about the answer before I read that, that question, but all right, I like the YouTubers who are doing the real serious in-depth testing and analytical work out there right now. So Gamers Nexus, I think, stands out there to me. They've gotten a lot of flack from people, but I think it's because they, they Steve and, and, the, and the crew over there takes a very critical look at anything that they get coming in. So oftentimes they point out stuff, critiques that uh, maybe aren't always caught. They also do very extensive testing, so that's pretty cool. Uh, definitely more extensive than I do over here, although based on some of the stuff they've done has encouraged me to improve some of my own techniques over time. Uh, beyond that, I would say Hardware, Hardware Unboxed uh, has been doing an insane amount of really good uh, testing of a lot of the recent launches of CPUs and GPUs that have come out. So Steve from Hardware Unboxed and, and, and crew over there is doing a fantastic job as well. And I feel like, again, I should have thought more about this. I, I saw the question, I was like, oh, that's a good question. I'll pop it up. And I, sh I should have done more research, like some more small tech YouTubers out there. Okay, I gave it a little thought, and uh, Andrew from Tech Team GB, uh, I like, I've seen quite a few of his videos, and I met him at Computex this year, and he's a really nice guy, so uh, if you want a smaller ch channel, just because I wanted to point out a smaller channel out there too, Tech Team GB is his channel, I'll post a link to that in the description. Next question though from Tim Murphy, what's the most expensive thing you have broken? Another really good question that I thought about, and I was like, oh, there's got to be some good answers out there, I, I couldn't think of anything that was like supremely substantial that I've actually just gone out and broken. I don't know, I don't know if I'm just lucky or not as clumsy or what. Like I, I'm definitely not like super coordinated or anything like that. Like I never played sports growing up or that kind of thing. So I do have a couple examples of things that I have that are broken that I maybe have broken one way or another. Uh, this one I've discussed a little bit. This is uh, one of my original two GH4s and I broke the uh, HDMI out on it. It's actually a micro HDMI out, which is not very sturdy behind this little tab here. And uh, I smashed a couple of the pins down in there via constant plugging and replugging of it. This camera is still perfectly functional as a camera. However, I can't do HDMI out on it, which limits some of my use of it. Although I still have been using it. So that's probably not the best example. A, a broken thing that I have is this AMD Athlon FX62, uh, Athlon 64 FX62, which back in the day uh, cost about $1,000, and this CPU is now broken, or at least it was last time I tried it, which was probably over five years ago now. So I trust that it probably is still broken, and it is a thing that, that was expensive at the time. It was a very, very jewel-worthy product too, so I'm glad I still have that. Kind of curious now that I've brought that up, I should like plug it back in and see if for some reason it's come back to life or something, because it, it's not like it has busted pins or anything, it was just non-functional. Anyway, sorry if I don't have better answers for that. If you guys have ever seen me break something in a past video, or like back in the, New Egg, in the New Egg videos or something, maybe bring that to my attention and I'll point it out next month. All right, next from Shaker Hobgoblin. Hey Paul, love the videos. I've recently built my first computer. It's a Ryzen 7 1700 with a GTX 1080 Ti, coming from an AMD A6 6300 and an OEM GT705. So, he had a pretty nice upgrade here uh, from that CPU and that GPU to, to the Ryzen 7 1700 and a 1080 Ti. His question is, what's the biggest hardware jump or biggest uh, upgrade that I've ever had? Uh, this also got me thinking back to the past and upgrades I've done and everything. 
I couldn't come up with a good GPU answer for this because I've, I've upgraded my GPUs pretty regularly. I went from a 7800 GTX to a, G, a GTX 260, Core 216, to I believe, I had two-way GTX 460s at some point. And then after that was when I started working at Newegg more and I, was, I, would, I would swap C GPUs out all the time. So it's harder to say, yeah, I had this specific graphics card for a specific period of time. But to give you a better answer, uh, Pentium 4, I had a Prescott-based Pentium 4 and a socket 478, uh, which looked very similar to this one right here. In fact, it might have been like this exact model. I don't remember the exact model off the top of my head here, but I used that up until 2004, 2005. Jumped from that to an Athlon 64 3200+, which was my first dual-core processor. This was a 67-watt TDP dual-core uh, AMD. This was, this was again back in that time frame when AMD was kind of kicking, kicking Intel's butt. And although this was uh, an early dual core, it still wasn't that cheap. I think when I got it, uh, it's, it would be the green line here. And I think when I got it, it was right around the $200 price. So yeah, uh, not terrible for a dual core. And then I jumped from that uh, a couple years later in 2008 time frame to an i7-920. And this was my first enthusiast platform, uh, you know, I, I had to get on the Intel enthusiast platform when it was available. So I managed to get a used LGA 1366 motherboard and that allowed me to invest the 300 to 320-ish dollars in the i7-920 and that got me up to a quad core with hyper threading and uh, that was my processor for quite some time. So that was kind of my, my remembrance of my CPU upgrades in the mid to late 2000s and I think those were, those stand out to me as like, I was really stoked each of those times that I made those upgrades and I used those systems for a couple of years each, at least. So uh, that's pretty good there. Next question is from Joe Tippett, and this is a long question. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it's there on the screen if you guys want to. But basically, he's thinking about a system upgrade. He wants to maybe upgrade to Ryzen. Right now, he has a Xeon E3 1231v3, which is a, a quad core, uh, and it's a, a, he's got a gigabyte Z97 MX Gaming 5. So his current system isn't all that old, although it is a Xeon. Uh, and he's got 4x4 four four gigs, of course, Air Vengeance Pro 2400 megahertz memory. So he's got a pretty decent system right now. And he's just saying, like, he's been itching to upgrade. Uh, is it worth it to upgrade to Ryzen, especially since he's been looking at the R3s? Now, just to make long story short here, my advice to you, Joe, directly, would be I wouldn't upgrade from this, your Xeon E3 1231 V3, to a Ryzen 3 because you'd be going from a quad core to a quad core. And honestly, I haven't looked at direct comparisons with the Xeon A3, but you're not gonna even see much of a single core performance difference between those. I would say only upgrade if you're ready to drop the cash on a six core or an eight core on that platform. Until then, just hold out because things aren't gonna get more expensive, probably unless you're talking about memory, they're probably gonna get less expensive when it comes to motherboards. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't side grade over to a, another quad core on the Ryzen platform, but you are correct that there is an upgrade path uh, for socket AM4, and AMD has promised to keep supporting it with CPUs uh, through 2020. So that's a couple years still to go, um, even a little, more, a little more than two years. So I would say hold out until you can afford that six core or the eight core to give yourself a little bit more of a like, yes, I upgraded feeling, uh, especially if you're looking at the pure CPU performance there. But thank you though, Joe. And next question is from Papa Doom. And this question has been asked before, so I thought I'd answer it again just really quickly because people ask me pretty frequently. Uh, but Papa Doom asked, hey Paul, my question is how do you earn money? I mean, uh, what do you do except YouTube or do I only do YouTube? Uh, the answer is right now I only do YouTube and I've only been doing YouTube for about the past three years now, give or take. Uh, I started doing YouTube independently on my own when my channel had about it was between 80,000 and 90,000 subscribers. Right now, I'm creeping up very ever so slowly on the 700,000 subscriber mark. And it's definitely a difficult thing to do to make a living out of making YouTube videos unless you can do it consistently. Uh, you have to have the passion to be able to keep coming back to it time, time after time. So you need to have some sort of topic or subject matter that you're enthusiastic about. But um, I wouldn't recommend starting a YouTube channel and saying, this is gonna be my job. Start it as a hobby first, do it for a while, and then uh, if you enjoy it, and if you feel, continue to feel passionate about it, even if you're not making that much money, then maybe it's something that you can keep investing uh, your time into to the point where you can earn enough money. My money, though, comes from four basic locations. Uh, location one is if you watch a YouTube video on YouTube and you get a pre-roll ad beforehand, or YouTube Red, alternatively, um, either way, 
those little bits of revenue that go to YouTube get shared with me and I get some money there. So if you do want to whitelist my YouTube channel, uh, that's much obliged. But hey, if you don't, then don't worry about it because I also integrate uh, ads. There's probably an ad at the beginning of this video. I try to make them very short, keep them about 20 seconds or so. So if you're watching on the YouTube app, you can double tap and skip it pretty quickly. Try to keep them short and to the point. Um, those I coordinate directly with vendors uh, such as like Gigabyte or, or uh, Cooler Master, that kind of thing. I also have a store where you can purchase stuff. That store is linked in the video's description. I don't make a ton of money from the store. We're not huge into merchandising, but um, it's a little bit. So um, stuff like this awesome hardware shirt that I'm wearing right now is available there. As well as, oh, like, yeah, look. I can advertise. Look, I also have bottle openers now. Uh, so store is another way. And then the last way is going to be uh, affiliate revenue. So if I talk about a product, such as, you know, a new motherboard or CPU or whatever, and I say this is available at Amazon, and I put an Amazon link in the description to it, that code, ha that is an affiliate link. And so if you go to Amazon and then you end up buying that product or anything else for that matter, I think within the next week or so, then I might get a cut of that as well, depending on the product that you purchase. So those are my four main means of income. And thankfully, I also have a wife who works full time who provides me uh, or who adds me to her health insurance. And that's how I get health insurance as well. And that has provided uh, a pretty reasonable means of us getting by, paying our bills and making sure that the mortgage payments go through. So there you go, a quick rundown of how I makes the monies on the YouTubes. Let's move on to Nolan Flynn. Can I replace the central heating in my house with four Vega 64 liquid cooled overclock graphics cards? Nolan, yes, you probably can. It might not be the best, most cost effective solution since uh, Vega 64 cards tend to be fairly overpriced right now. They've come down a little bit, but they're still uh, fairly overpriced. And, and since they're made to do stuff besides just producing heat, um, granted, I'm, your question's probably not that serious, but I'm answering it seriously. I don't care. Over on PC Gamer, there's an article linked in the description about a company in France. We talked about this on our live show a few weeks ago. They are building computers uh, that are gonna be used for, as servers, cloud computing systems, but also they're gonna function as home and office he heaters. Anyway, I don't wanna go too far into this, but the article's linked in the description. So they have an actual somewhat feasible means of taking a, a useful thing like a computer that also happens to generate heat, putting it somewhere where that heat generation can put the heat to good use, I guess. Anyway, let's move on. All right, Waleed Shah has the next question. This was more of a comment or pointing out of a thing or a follow-up from something I've talked about in the previous uh, video when we were talking about uh, Windows 10 licenses. He's pointing out that um, if you change hardware with Windows 10, it is possible to swap your hardware uh, and still maintain your Windows 10 license. He linked to a Windows Central article on doing that. I have uh, included that link in this video's description as well. And basically the solution is to, to connect your Windows 10 license with your Microsoft account, uh, which is a total valid way of doing this. It's not something that I've advocated very much or even shown how to do before, because basically you're taking your license and instead of attaching it to your hardware, you're attaching it to yourself personally. And you can take that license and go to some other completely random Windows 10 computer and still uh, be able to sign in. I'm sorry, that Microsoft account, and still be able to sign in with the Microsoft account. What that does is one, requires you to have a Microsoft account, Two, it also means that Microsoft can track you around with what you're doing and everything, which you may or may not be okay with. Hey, Google does a lot, so maybe you're absolutely fine with that. The way that I like to activate Windows 10, though, is to activate it to the system, uh, not using the Microsoft account. Uh, when you do that, it takes whatever key that you get. It burns that key. That key's gone. It creates a new unique key that's specifically tied to your hardware, your motherboard, as far as I can tell in the testing I've done. And then that key is now attached to that hardware forever which means if you were to go and wipe Windows off of that, take that hardware and have a completely new, say, SSD or something and install Windows, Windows 10 onto it again, you should just, it should just activate. It should recognize the hardware, know that they already have an activated key in their database attached to that hardware, and then it should just work again. Uh, that's happened to me with at least three different systems that I've done this with before. And uh, I guess to, to come back to the, the original question, Yes, it is a valid solution to do a Microsoft account attached Windows 10 license, and then you can have that and you can use it yourself. And it's a valid way of doing it. It's just not something that I've done very much before. So that's why I've mainly advocated the old school method of tying the key to your hardware. Um, but yeah, nothing wrong with that either. And that is all the questions I have for today. So guys, I hope you have enjoyed. This has been Probing Paul episode number 20. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. And I am gonna get back to work on like clean. Have you guys noticed it's kind of clean? Done some cleaning and stuff. 
lately. Stoked on that. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna get back to work. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time.